Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you to the Aquinas Center's webinar entitled Synodality and Truthfulness, the Workings of a Sideways God. Today's webinar is brought to you in partnership with Commonweal Magazine and is a part of our What's Next series, which explores what we can do as lay leaders to make a positive impact for the future of the Catholic Church. My name is Alice Cameron, and I'm serving as the Acting Executive Director of the Aquinas Center. For those of you who are joining your first Aquinas Center event, I would like to begin by sharing a little about our organization. The Aquinas Center proudly provides Catholic community programming that invites conversation while fostering our faith. Our mission serves the Archdiocese of Atlanta, Emory University, and the greater Atlanta community by providing a gathering space to discuss theological topics and timely issues. This year, the Aquinas Center is celebrating our 35th anniversary. We have planned an outstanding year of programs to commemorate this milestone. And we begin our celebration with today's webinar. And we are so excited to have you be a part of this celebration. At this time, I am thrilled to introduce you to Dr. Marie Marquardt who is chair of the Aquinas Center's Board of Directors. Dr. Marquardt is a scholar in residence at Emory University's Candler School of Theology, in addition to being an author of young adult novels. Marie is also an immigration advocate and a founding co-chair of El Refugio, a nonprofit that serves and offers hospitalities to detained immigrants and their families. Please welcome Marie, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much, Alice, and thank you for your excellent leadership at the Aquinas Center. We are so grateful for you. This afternoon, we're pleased to be in conversation with James Allison. And before I introduce James, I want to let you know that after the lecture, we will have some time for questions and answers. So please, throughout the lecture, if a question occurs to you, we encourage you to uh, submit the question using the Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you please use the Q&A rather than the chat function for questions, as um, sometimes questions can get lost in the chat. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. James Allison is a Catholic theologian, priest, and author. He has studied, lived, and worked in Mexico, Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, Spain, and the United States, as well as in his native England. James earned his doctorate in theology from the Jesuit faculty in Belo Horizonte, Brazil in 1994, and is a systematic theologian by training. James is celebrated for bringing the uh, French thinker René Girard's work to a wider public. He's also well known for his firm but patient insistence on truthfulness in matters gay as an ordinary part of basic Christianity. And he's deeply appreciated for his pastoral outreach among LGBTQ Christians in both Catholic and ecumenical settings. James was brought up in an evangelical Anglican family, and he became a Catholic at the age of 18 in 1978. He was ordained a priest in 1988. Having lived with the Dominican order between 1981 and 1995, James now is a fellow of Imitatio and works as an itinerant preacher, lecturer, and retreat giver. When not on the road, James lives in Madrid, Spain, and he joins us from Madrid this afternoon. Today, James will explore how the Holy Spirit may be nudging us into creating new forms of belonging for and with each other. Please join me in warmly welcoming James Allison to speak with us today on Synodality and Truthfulness, the Workings of a Sideways God. Welcome, James. Thank you very much indeed, Marie. Uh, thank you very much for a lovely introduction. And let me tell you what a great pleasure it is for me to be with you uh, in, uh, in Atlanta, though, from, from Madrid. Though you're in Portland and I'm in, I'm in Madrid. Um, I'm going to talk to you, as Marie uh, told you, on synodality and truthfulness, the workings of a sideways God. But I'd like to start uh, by saying that I'm going to be ind indulging in some unashamed blue sky thinking or kite flying, because we've all heard a good deal about synodality over the last year and a half. Um, and some of that has been very granular, and some of it has been uh, very 
theoretical. What I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about how we find ourselves becoming involved in the process, not so much talking about particular steps you might take, since I imagine that most of you uh, will already have been involved in one way or another, whether through uh, academic institutions or through parishes or through dioceses with the synodal process. What I want to talk is, in a sense, about the change in basic Christianity that affects our way of being church. And uh, that, I hope, is going to lead to a better understanding of what we're on the inside of as we come to think more synodally and live synodality uh, more wholeheartedly, rather than think of it as uh, some sort of talk shop that uh, uh, complicated people in Rome have invented uh, because they've run out of better things to do. So I don't know whether you have access to the um, skeleton which I have uh, prepared for you. Um, if, if you don't, Marie, I don't know if there's a way you could make available for the participants the skeleton, uh, but I would uh, come to little point one. My little point one is entitled who sacrifices whom to whom? Two accounts of sacrifice. Um, it seems an odd place to start when talking about synodality, but I want to ask you to stick with me as I take you down this route, because I think that one of the big things that happened uh, with Vatican II was that the generation of theologians who produced it had managed to work uh, their way towards a genuine understanding of what real Christianity requires from us. And that included, very notably, a major reorienting of the liturgy as a way of understanding what it is that God is asking of us. But there was not yet made available for people a basic understanding of what Christ came to do. What was the sense of Christ's death? With the result that many of us, even though it's more than 50 years now since the council, have been brought up with a strange mixture of very modern sounding texts from Vatican II and very ancient sounding understandings of Christ's death lived out in different liturgical forms, many of which are not helpful at all. So what I'd like to do is to start by uh, indicating what we're moving on from, because there was an old understanding of liturgy, and this is something that was shared, uh, there was an old understanding of Christ's death, and this was something shared in different ways, both on the Protestant and on the Catholic side of the Reformation, whereby Christ's death was in some way or another, Jesus being sacrificed to God. In other words, God was very angry with humanity and particularly with sin. We had fallen into terrible sin. Um, God was very angry with this. God needed someone to sort this out. None of us was up to the task because of our sinfulness. So Jesus said, listen, I'm both God and man. So humans can't pay the price for themselves, but I can pay the price because I'm God as well as a human. So I'll become, uh, I'll become a human and then I'll pay the price to you. Your wrath will be satisfied. And all those people who are covered over by my blood will be saved. And God said, basically, yep, okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm a terrible, violent hurricane. But thanks to you, there will be an eye to the hurricane, a place where all is peaceful. And that will be the church where those people are covered by the blood. And I will still have terrible wrath for uh, sinners and wicked people who are cast out. But in the center, there will be a place of salvation, which you will have bought. Now, as you know, there are Protestant and Catholic versions of that. That uh, idea was first uh, theorized by St. Anselm, and it was then 
uh, hardened, uh, let us say, by Luther and Calvin in the 16th century to become what is known as the penal substitution theory of atonement. And it's lived to this day uh, as the central ideology of many evangelical texts and it's uh, many, uh, many evangelical groups. Um, and it's lived uh, sacramentally by some of those who are most resistant to the Second Vatican Council and its liturgical changes. It's very been very interesting to read some of those who are most upset by uh, Pope Francis's abrogation of Pope Benedict's permission to go back to the old uh, right. Uh, and their defense of it is that it's you see the priest offering the sacrifice to God. Now, here's the thing about that world. That world, the world in which someone is sacrificed to God, is a sacred world in which the sacrifice pays a price. Let's just imagine it in this way. God was terribly angry with sin. Sin could be quite clearly delineated. In fact, much of the Old Testament is a list of sins uh, in this way of thinking, uh, which delineates what humans do wrong, known as the law. And again, I'm not saying that's what the Old Testament is really about. I'm saying that's the caricature of it, which uh, which we've been taught to live and inhabit from our, from our youth. Um, so when Jesus died, he paid the price for those sins. In other words, every item on the, the recipe of wrongness was covered. So now that he's died, we've got to hold on to exactly that list. Um, and uh, that list is completely guaranteed by, uh, by God, by the Bible, if you're a Protestant, and by the church's magisterium, if you're a Catholic. So what's the church's magisterium to do? Well, it's here to hold on to the exactness of the lists, because if you don't do that, you're dissing Jesus's death. Or saying Jesus paid the wrong bill, or he paid too much or too little, or it was just the wrong payment. Uh, the sacrifice makes sin the center of the game, the reality around which everything else dances. God sorting out sin by a sacrifice, sacrificing his son to himself in our midst, getting us to do the actual uh, dirty work of the sacrifice, but essentially sacrificing himself to himself so as to pay a debt to himself and all off stage and us being allowed to enjoy the fruits provided we now behave. So Christianity after that model then becomes a, okay, now I've paid the price, I've died for you, now behave. The Holy Spirit has given us, if you like, as moral fiber so that we, uh, we, we are able to live up to the new form of behavement, of good behavior, uh, which the paying of the price of sin has achieved for us. Now, it was already quite clearly understood by many of the fathers at Vatican II, including famously, for those of you who are concerned about this, by Joseph Ratzinger in his 1968 book, uh, Introduction to Christianity, that that understanding of Christ's death really won't do. It has God sacrificing God to God, with humans as bit players, thus acquiring terrible guilt in the case of the Jewish people who then get blamed for it, for this act when it was really God's way of paying God. But it locks us down into a pyramidical form of knowledge. In other words, God knows what is good or bad. He's told us in the Bible, or he's told us through the magisterium of the church, he's paid the price. Now we know what's good. Stick with it. In other words, a very defensive form of knowing. Now, we've begun to re-understand those uh, texts to understand what was going on in Jesus's dying. And exactly the same texts that have been read as though it was if you like, someone being sacrificed to God to pay a price, are now able to be understood in a way which is actually much richer and much closer to the original uh, um, understanding, as far as we can tell, from the, um, from the Hebrew texts and from the understanding of atonement going back to the first temple, which is 
that the whole purpose of Jesus' death was God offering himself or God's self to us. In other words, the violent divinity in the equation is not God, in whom there is no violence at all, but us. We are the people whose wrath needs to be assuaged. And typically, we assuage our wrath by ganging up together against someone who we blame for all our problems and uh, stabbing them in the back, killing them, throwing them out, whatever. And what was Jesus's going to his death? But God saying, effectively, yes, I know that you do this. I know that you are terribly prone to this violence, even though it's not really who you are. I know that your way of being has structured you in terrible sacred forms of killing and fake goodness by trying to make yourself good by casting other people out. I know that that's what you're inclined to do. And I'm really, really keen to be able to get you off that game. So I'm going to occupy the central place in your horribly violent drama, which is your killing people to make yourselves good, to build yourself unity, to, uh, to say it is better that one man die than that the nation should perish, to use Caiaphas's words. I'm going to occupy exactly that place to show you that I love you, that however awful you are in doing that, I don't hold it against you. This is what you do. And I'm here showing you, yes, you do this, and the person to whom you do it is basically innocent. Which means you can be forgiven, and you can start to learn how to play another game, start to learn how to become a new people, not over against each other, but by receiving yourselves from the forgiveness of your victim. I hope you can see that exactly the same texts can point either in the direction of us trying to satisfy God's wrath (laughs) or God trying to appease our wrath, trying to get us off wrath. And if you like, one of the key features of the New Testament, one of the great surprises of the New Testament, if you like, is the realization of the shock that it was amongst people expecting the coming of God's Messiah, God's anointed one, by the lack of violence therein that there was not retribution. What Jesus' coming did was revealed human violence and showed us how to get off it. Anyhow, that makes a huge difference to understanding what Catholicity is about, what being a Christian is about. Because in the one case, it's about being made holy by receiving the blood and thereafter living defensively in a kind of a group huddle of the good protecting ourselves from the wickedness of others who are going to hell in a handcart because of of wrath. And the other is God coming into our midst and saying, actually, I really like you. I'm so keen that you should actually be able to become fulfilled, become who you really are, start to become really alive as humans. In fact, become my daughters and sons, being able to live as if death were not, no longer run by death and its fear, as the epistle to the Hebrews says, and learning to be able to create forms of unity together that actually do you good, rather than depending on cruelty and denigration and uh, belittlement of each other. Entirely different pictures of Catholicity. One is a closed down and defensive, and the other is open-ended and constantly reaching out to more and more different groups of people over against whom we're inclined to create our goodness. Now, If the second model, which is the one uh, which I'm going to be presenting to you, is the one that is really underpinning the changes of Vatican II, you can see how it's going to make a huge difference to our understanding and living of of the sacraments, and a huge difference to our learning what it is to be together, to form togetherness, and to construct belonging in and as the church. One, as I say, is the closed down pyramidal model. The other is open-ended adventurous model, which is, uh, to use Pope Francis's church, Iglesia en Salida, uh, the church in an outward movement, the church heading out. It's constantly 
uh, trying to undo uh, the different forms of violence and recover true humanity from under its ruins, wherever we find it in the world. Now, we're at little point two here. Given this different account of why Jesus did what he did, in other words, coming to do something for us rather than paying a price for God, it means that his death becomes part of his gift to us, occupying its space so that we no longer need be run by it, but more particularly so that he could give us God's spirit. So rather than the purpose of death being, Jesus' death being to pay for sin, which was the old model with the old form of belonging and the old sacramental structure that went with it, we're now beginning to understand Jesus occupying the space of death as being Jesus making it possible for God's spirit to come amongst us, make it possible for the dwelling place of God to be with humans, which of course was the promise from the beginning through the prophets and actually in what Jesus said he was doing. In other words, Jesus was coming into our midst so as to enable creation to be fulfilled by us being given the spirit and start to actually live the holiness of God starting now. Not with a separate holiness kept in a temple, but with us becoming the temple, with the holiness of God starting to be uh, lived out now. Now, here's the interesting question. If we're stuck in the old way of understanding Jesus' death, then we fatally think of the Holy Spirit as above all something coming down, because our whole way of thinking is pyramidal. So the Holy Spirit comes down and solves the function, if you like, of giving us the moral strength to be able to do the right thing and stick with the recipe of sins, which we've inherited. And it also has the nice advantage of it, it illuminates the hierarchy so that they're able to teach the church. Uh, that's the, again, the old fashioned uh, way of uh, looking. I'm not saying it doesn't do that, but not in the top down way <laughs> in which it was imagined. In the way that I'm beginning to suggest to you, what we see Jesus is doing is constantly a sideways movement, what I call Jesus's fraternal relocation of God. Let's remember that in the New Testament, the only time the paternal voice of God talks, the only time we ever hear God the Father speaking, is on the couple of occasions when the voice says, this is my son, do what he tells you. This is my son, in him is my pleasure. This is my son, obey him. In other words, what we have is the father entrusting everything to an horizontal process. Thereafter, everything will be fraternal. All teaching will be at the fraternal level. It will be at the human scale, from a human, among humans. This is brought out in so many different ways in the New Testament, and it's so easy for us to forget it, especially if we're stuck in the old model of sacrifice. Because if we're stuck in the old model of sacrifice, of course, we have God the Father as the center of consciousness outside of all that's going on, looking down, getting very worried about things, being a bit relieved when his son uh, pays the price, and then sending down messages constantly trying defensively to keep us on side. That's what the Holy Spirit is about. Whereas instead, what we have is God in Jesus taking the enormous risk, opening up the adventure of saying, I wonder where creation is going to go. I'm going to put it entirely in human hands. My son is going to be the measuring point, the be and all and end all, the logos, the structuring word of the whole of reality. And that means that in as far as humans become like my son, they too are going to enter into the reality of what is. And this is all going to be done at the fraternal or at the sibling level, not as part of a top-down exercise. That's my dare. That's how I'm going to treat them. And this 
sibling effort is going to work through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to be able to be given them when Jesus has finally conquered death. So that the deathless spirit will then be able to become the master narrator, the master builder of a human narrative, such that humans are able to live the truth without fear of death. That's the adventure, and I wonder where they're going to take it. Like the, the adventurous nature of God. Now, please notice that uh, I'm not making this up, you know, the, when Jesus comes amongst the disciples in John's Gospel, uh, at the very end, in the, uh, in the scene of, the, of the, re the great resurrection appearance, he breathes the Spirit into them, uh, same verb as with uh, breathing into Adam at the, uh, uh, at the creation, it's exactly the same verb, and then it says, uh, whomsoever you forgive, it will be forgiven, whoever you don't forgive, it will not be forgiven, it will be retained. In other words, the whole power for taking this adventure forward works through forgiveness, and it's in your hands now. From now on, it's going to be entirely sideways working through you. This is an enormous challenge, an enormous challenge to us. We need to be very brave to accept the charge, if you like, to accept the, the commission to be taking this uh, forward, because it means there's no longer an outside deus ex machina God, whom we can quickly construct a pyramid to hold on to our goodness in the midst of all our fear. On the contrary, we find ourselves learning to trust that in the midst of all the fear, the Holy Spirit is actually bringing us to life, bringing us to life. And that's actually what the Acts of the Apostles is all about, this wonderful process by which the still fairly hierarchically minded apostolic group learns to become much more down to the humble fraternal level and sees to their amazement the gospel take off. The great, great line of St. Paul at Philippians, uh, for though he was, uh, although he does not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped. Now the thing to be grasped, we often think of it as holding on to yourself, but no, it means he wasn't grasping it onto it as for himself alone. It meant something to be shared. That was the, op the opposite of being grasped, is something to be shared out. Equality with God. That's what is being given us by the Holy Spirit. This is the most remarkable of the, the Christian teachings, and one which we so easily forget because we put back God defensively up there rather than allowing ourselves to believe that God works between and among us at the horizontal level. This is why I refer to the Holy Spirit as sideways God. Here we are at little point three. Sideways God, having come amongst us and moving us relationally into greater and greater understanding. As we learn to bear witness to the truth, that has a knock-on effect, so we're actually able to learn from each other over time, always at a horizontal level and with ever less necessity to try and reach out so as to sacrifice to God in order to put things right. On the contrary, God has sacrificed to us to make us not frightened and therefore to enable everything to move on. Now, dare I say, this has enormous consequences for learning, knowledge, and thus truthfulness. One of the principal uh, philosophical structures that we inherited basically from the 17th till the 20th century in the church was the philosophical structure offered by René Descartes, the Cartesian way of thinking. It has many virtues, but its anthropology is profoundly defensive. It's so concerned about the fallibility of our bodily knowledge that it seeks some clear and distinct ideas in a spirit that is able to know itself, that is somehow separate from bodiliness. And of course, this has had a terrible effect on our ecclesiology, our understanding of the church, because it's enabled it to seem common sense to people that there should be a head of the church, in other words, 
bishops and the Pope, who have clear and distinct ideas, and we who are the body, who are full of unruly passions, who cannot really be trusted. Our passions are so dangerous, are so wayward, that we can't really learn from them. Now, there are two different versions of this. There's the more extreme version, which is taught or was taught in some Protestant forms, which is the radical depravity taught by uh, Calvin and still holds to in some circles, whereby literally, because we fell so badly, we cannot know anything from ourselves. We can only learn from the words of the Bible. So sola scriptura becomes the form of learning held in a Cartesian sense. And therefore, the Bible becomes a form of clear and distinct idea that must be implanted on any reality, which means, of course, readings of the Bible which are entirely fake, because the Bible was never written by such people. It wasn't, a, a um, if you like, a primitive attempt at botched American constitutional law, uh, as Stanley Hauerwas pointed out many years ago. It's an entirely different series of genre of writing. But the Catholic equivalent of, of that Cartesianism has been a head which thinks with clear and distinct ideas and a body, the rest of the church, which is basically unruly and has passions and therefore uh, must be obedient and can't learn from experience, but must always uh, adhere to, excuse me, I've got something in my eye, uh, adhere to uh, what church teaches. Now, what has changed at the same time as the process of the Vatican Council trying to take us into this more horizontal church, which now Pope Francis is trying to take us into through synodality, is of course the realization that that model of thinking, the Cartesian model, the clear and distinct ideas above and the unruly passions um, below, is simply not true. It's just not true about how humans learn. And that it bizarrely much more true to say that humans learn relationally. Relationality is prior to rationality. In other words, it's as our relationships with people change, so we learn what is true. While you're in a conspiratorial huddle with people, you only know what you knew already and prove yourself right by. So if you know already that the American election was stolen, you, you join a conspiratorial huddle of people uh, who agree with that. And literally everything you know is determined by that. You can't learn more outside that. Your relationship forms and maintains your rationality. And of course, ultimately, those really bad relationality leads to bad knowledge, which can lead to group suicide. It can lead to absolute collapse of societies and ways of being together. But changes of relationality also lead to changes of ideas. As you find your tendency to defensiveness uh, needing to be altogether over against someone undone by the presence of people who you would formerly have regarded as they, like Gentiles, or in the case of Catholic clergy, women, or in the case of all of us, LGBT people, and especially now trans people. So rather than finding that our world is blown apart, we actually just find ourselves learning what is truer about ourselves than we did before. Relationality is prior to rationality. Witness is what leads to truthfulness. Witness produces a change of relationality, which leads to an ability to know more and to tell the truth. This is an horizontal process. And the way you stop it is by saying, whoa, 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 I'm learning too much. Stop the world, I want to get off. I need to go back to a form in which someone was right, who was out standing outside this, this scrum uh, and who says what's right. And then I can hold on to my reality because, no, that's actually not offered by Christianity. That's what offered by pagan religions. Pagan religions, going back to antiquity, uh, are group holding mechanisms, what we would call now called identitarian, group holding mechanisms, that enable people to stick together over against others and not to learn outside their group. Christianity and especially Catholicism, the word holos, according to the whole, just means that. <laughs> it's the wholeness of human learning to which we are officially 
not only officially, but uh, constantly and spiritually moved. That's part of what being a Catholic is all about. Little point five. Now, this involves a shift from a prioristic learning to historical, experiential, and dynamic understanding. When I say a prioristical learning, uh, what do I mean? I mean, you know something general in advance about something, and therefore you deduce how to act. So you start off with, for instance, if you're a parent uh, of a small of a small child or or someone who's meeting a very small child, you don't yet know much about what their personality is going to be. They've given some hints. But as a general principle, you hear from other people who have experts in childcare what to expect in the first weeks with a baby, what to expect uh, when it comes to teething, what to expect when it comes to walking, what to expect when it comes to talking, uh, how your four-year-old is likely to behave. And you follow from general principles, which you hear from others, and you apply them to your child, learning to adjust them as you begin to discover who your child really is. But that only works while knowledge is somewhat distant and until the child can actually begin to express themselves. Once they start to express themselves, you begin to discover things that maybe are just things typical of an adolescent, but maybe are who they really are coming into being. In other words, you discover the limits of general knowledge from which you make general deductions and you start to acquire particular knowledge which means that you can actually begin to relate to that person as they are and learn things about them and learn things about yourself as you deal with them. Now, our church has worked for a very long time on the basis that there is a prioristic knowledge and that we should just make deductions. At the Second Vatican Council, this was made quite clearly uh, not to be the case any longer the historical method, the empirical method, these were accepted in the major documents of the Vatican Council. If you want to look at Lumen Gentium 36, you'll see a good chapter well set out on how the empirical method is appropriate and proper, precisely because God is the God of creation, and that therefore everything that is created can be understood ever better to understand what it's for and how it gives glory to God. But of course, Many elements in our church since the Second Vatican Council have resisted Vatican's teaching on that method, especially when it's been anything to do with family, gender, sexual orientation, and so on. Those they have held to strictly a prioristic accounts, meaning you can't learn from here because experiential knowledge is too likely to be a passionate sinning. Uh, it's too likely simply to be wrong. But in fact, what the church has been teaching us since the Second Vatican Council, and I long for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith to accept uh, Lumen Gentium and start to allow its teaching to be affected by it, is uh, the historical dimension to all learning, the experiential dimension to all learning, since all our learning is actually experiential because it's always relational. It's always others who have brought us into being through families, schools, public discourses, the language we share, which means that our experience of the reality is what leads us to be able to tell the truth. Not, we have dangerous experiences, but we all have little um, supreme pontiffs in our head that can tell us what is true or not. Uh, no, our, our intellect is a wonderful thing and enables us to filter through our experiences and gradually come to the truth. In the case of humans, slowly, with a mixture of errors and so forth, that's how we are. But it's part of the process of learning. So historical, experiential and dynamic understanding of learning, which includes learning truthfulness. One of the examples which I like to give uh, is, in a sense it's very obvious, is the, um, the way in which precisely the undoing of the scapegoating mechanism regarding gay and lesbian people is what's led us to be able to understand something true. Whereas before, and still in some societies, 
again, there's what people are obvious scapegoats. They are obviously the people who throw out when you want to keep your group holy and good. But since the end of the Second World War, actually the end of the First World War was a very important moment as well, the end of the Second World War, and the, the possibility of a sufficient mass of people to be able to be identified as who they are, it became possible to realize that there is no pathology intrinsic to these people. It's not that they're a problem, it's that their treatment has been a problem. And if there is no pathology intrinsic to these people, then their flourishing must be from them, not in spite of them. By undoing the scapegoat mechanism, you learn something true about what it is to be human. And what is true has a knock-on effect, such that we learn more and more true things about all of us, who we are, changes. And at this particular moment, the violence is much more strongly concentrated on trans people, and the learning process is the same. In the degree to which we overcome the scapegoating mechanism, so we enter into truth. That's how the Holy Spirit brings the gospel to life in our midst. So given that, what I'd like to suggest is that synodality, rather than the pyramidical movement of sacrifice guaranteed, close down the world so that we can be good, synodality is an attempt to live out the sideways, and I would describe it as helicoidal movement, the movement like a helix. If you imagine a sideways helix, of movement going round together at the same time, by which we come together in new ways, we learn to tell the truth together in new ways, we are able to learn to appreciate what is true and what is false in new ways. And that means that the place of signed teaching, uh, those who are given the sacrament of orders and oversight, so priests, bishops, uh, regardless of gender in the future, are going to have a place within that helicoidal dynamic as part also of the learning process and the sifting through process, so as to be able to learn how to teach and share what is true, rather than their current model, which is people who can't learn anything, but just have to hold on to the recipe because that's what guarantees the stability of everything. So it's this helicoidal sideways movement with a new understanding of what's going to be the process of discernment by those who hold the sacrament, the sacramental, the signed job of teaching. That's how we're living out the understanding of sacrifice that has come alive and that's able to bring, bring out quite how forward-looking Vatican II was and quite how held back we have been by fear of letting go of uh, the old model of sacrifice. Just like to end, with this is little point seven, just some hints of new belonging. I haven't wanted to be more specific with you because for obvious reasons, I don't know you. I've not been able to uh, live amongst you. So uh, I don't know what your particular concerns are in Atlanta or, or more far afield. Um, so I'm just having to offer, as it were, some more general hints. And the first is, the realization that there is a quite specific process of the Catholic formation of we, and thus of I. The Catholic understanding is that the we is always before the I. It's the we that makes the I. The group is always before the individual. The church is always before, the universal church is always before the local church and the, uh, and the individuals in the church. And I think that's a tremendously good thing, unless it's misread as saying, there is a we who is always right, and you, the individual, are always wrong, so you must adjust yourselves and become a, a, a parrot of the we, which of course far too often has been the case. The way the we works in the helicoidal system is precisely the non-identitarian way of all of us undergoing a constant purging, if you like, expoliation of the false ways of belonging to the world's we, into which we are all born, and finding ourselves given the new eyes that are part of a shared we. The reverse of that, of course, would be in the, the more traditional Protestant understanding, which is that you start with the I, the I comes first, and what is the church? The church is a, a 
persuading a group of other eyes to form together a voluntary association of other eyes. And that becomes a we, but the we is much less important than the eyes in it. It seems to me that the, the focus of construction, if you like, the, very often the Protestants give us the, the end of the process, which is what we should be, is newly created eyes who are in harmony with the we who has brought us into being, but which has learned how to let go of so many forms of false belonging, which seem to be holy, but in fact are sacred forms created by nationalism or party politics or our own racial blindness or our old own sexual blindness, whatever that may be. There are n numbers of forms of belonging, all of which need purifying. And our education with each other is a constant process of the we being purified so that new eyes who are a we together can come alive. And within that, something which I think as yet is tremendously difficult and rare, which is for us to be able to speak to each other as you in non-accusatory ways. Isn't it difficult that, isn't it interesting that the word you usually comes with a finger point and is the assumption that I'm calling you, uh, I'm pointing something out, I'm accusing you in some way. But it seems to be one of the things which we at the moment lack within our church too much dominated by a fake uh, we and not really yet allowed to be I eyes is the inability to speak as you to you. When we talk to church officials, they tend to give us official arguments as though there is some we that is massively prior and that must be always respected. And those that the people themselves have not actually become eyes. They have become masks for a fake we. They've been given magisterial persona, magisterial personas which are which are terrible masks. There's a lack of lack of uh, there there. The ability for us to learn to be you to you, to always look at each other and say you as something that is a blessing, the beginning of a blessing. That is, I think, part of what uh, uh, the new understanding of Catholicity is to allow. I think that it enables us a much richer understanding of Eucharistic community, where we understand that the sharing of the word means not only a homily, but the shared response to a homily. A homily, what one would hope that the preacher brings alive the words of scripture, so as to show how Jesus's presence wants to manifest itself that day, and then be able to share people's response to it so that we can learn from each other who we are as we share Jesus who is giving himself to us in our midst. And, and this seems to be the final note on which I wish to enter and perhaps the subject for a another lecture altogether. One of the things I notice is that we as Christians have been failing, at least in the English speaking world, and I think more widely beyond that, is to enable ourselves, our co-religionists and our wider societies to live with shame. So much, I think, of the reactions we've seen in the last few years on the political and religious front, panicked adherence to loony doctrines, to harsh doctrines, to loony political positions, to harsh political positions, is to do with those who are in flight from shame and call themselves Christians. But the whole point of Christianity was the one who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, cross thought, of uh, thought of as nothing the shame and is seated to the right hand of God. In other words, that we're able to sit with our shame, held delicacy with each other, not panic each other into fight, flight, or freeze. And so actually be able to become better sharers of mercy, grace, and truthfulness with each other. That, I hope, is the direction in which a synodal church is taking us. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, James Allison. Um, you've given us um, just so many rich and profound um, uh, ways to enter into this envisioning, this visioning together um, of a new path forward. I, I love that you began with uh, this image of the sending up of kites. Um, and I certainly, um, I know that many of us, as we've listened to you, just 
have seen these kites in the air and are and are um, working to to process and think through and 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 relationally uh, vision um, how how this will lead us forward. Um, we do have a few questions, very specific questions in the chat that I want to make sure that we um, are able to to ask. Um, the first of the questions comes from um, Luis Gutierrez, and um, Luis said he has met you in Philadelphia and is glad to be back with you. Um, Luis asks. Can we expect the synodal process to enable the church to transcend patriarchal theologies about issues of human sexuality, such as the gender binary and the ordination of women? And I know you began to speak on this a bit, but I wonder if you could expand a bit. Yes, uh, I'm a, a longtime follower of Luis's and uh, receive his updates almost every day. Um, and I... Uh, I do agree. I think that if one of the things, the most obvious things that is absolutely global in the responses to the uh, to the synodal process is uh, really uh, complete in patients, quite right in patients, with, un unless women are, are speaking at the same level as uh, as men, you really can't forget it. Um, it's simply not possible to be Christian and not have that kind of shared. <laughs> Uh, uh, participation. Um, I think that that's. I think that's absolutely right. Now, how that is going to be done, how an anthropological shift uh, like that is made to happen, given different parts of the world on different speed uh, bands in different ways. Uh, well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. But I think that the evidence that that is a sine qua non of the synodal process is is very very strong. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, another um, uh, question has come in. Um, and the question is that Jesus also speaks about wailing and gnashing of teeth and the punishment that comes to the unfaithful. Um, and this questioner asks, how can these scriptural texts be interpreted from the perspective of the sideways God that you're discussing? Oh, um, well, of course, we'd have to look at each at each text in in turn, but I would say that that is absolutely um, part of the uh, how the sideways God works. I mean, one of the things that Jesus is doing in his parables, parables typically is shifting people's expectations as to where uh, the violence is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it's a constant exercise in a very deliberate sort of irony, asking people to occupy occupy the place uh, that they put other people into, <laughs> so they could understand what's really uh, what's really going on. I don't think that Jesus is. Uh, um, I don't think that Jesus is trying to set up a, you know, a, what's the word a ah, a three dimensional picture of what is above, what is in the middle, and what is below, as though these are fixed places that people have, are going to be are going to be sent to. That's the easy way to doing it. On the contrary, I think he's very much saying, uh, this is what your living of your life now actually looks like. Where are you going to be in it? <laughs> you know, that's the uh, the ultimate the ultimate response at the uh, in the great Matthew twenty five scene with the sheep and the goats is not. I'm going to send you to somewhere, but effectively you have already sent yourself somewhere. <laughs> That's the question. Where are you sending yourselves? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So, go, go ahead, please. Continue. Sorry, 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 but that's it. But obviously we'd have to uh, look through the, uh, the parables. I try for, for anyone who doesn't know, I'll give a little boost. I try to give a commentary on the gospel of every Sunday on my site called Praying Eucharistically. So I've had great fun actually reading many of the uh, the gospels which deal with these uh, with these issues. Uh, yes, would it's, highly it's, recommend it's, spending time there for those of y'all who uh, haven't had a chance. Uh, yeah, um, you know, and I think that really does tie back to the way that you ended this question of um, uh, us holding one another and and um, supporting one another in our shame um, in this kind of that we are called to to enter into that and and um, and hold and create space for. Um, and honor and support and be compassionate toward one another. Um, and that I think some of those texts are pointing toward that, that need for us to gather and hold one another. Um, uh, you've had a, a, there are a few questions that um, I think tie to um, something that I was thinking about as I was um, listening to you speak. Um, 
about the the real bravery that's required to uh, to accept or take on the commission um, that we are given if um, if we enter into um, living into this relational sideways understanding of how the Holy Spirit works among us um, and um, and also of of how we produce knowledge um, and the kind of relational understanding of how we uh, move forward and, and begin to understand truths. Um, and that that takes a real courage, that takes um, a bravery. Um, uh, and it, several folks, I think, are kind of wondering um, about how how we undertake that. And you know, one of the questions we received is is really a question about sort of institutionally where we might find space for that. Um, someone asked in the uh, catechumenal process, RCIA seems to be like the process. Um, toward being a we, so they kind of maybe one of the the locations, the institutional locations where we might begin to do that. Could you comment on that and and other place, you know, institutional locations that we might begin to build together this courageous action? Yes. Well, here's the thing: the, the courageous action is the production of witnesses. Everyone who's confirmed the assumption of confirmation is confirmation is. Uh, the time, the time when you start being ready to witness. And that doesn't mean going and standing on a street, street corner or announcing that the end of the world is nigh. Uh, but it means agreeing that your life is going to be a certain counterfactual uh, witness to something that is not visible but is coming, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the kingdom. Uh, and that it's as you're prepared to do that that you find yourself uh, able to be accepted as someone truthful over time. Mm -hmm. And that's a lifelong, a lifelong thing. So yes, I think the RCIA is, is a way of, of doing that, but, but, but the Boy Scouts may also be a way of doing that. And joining a trade union movement may also be a way of doing that. Uh, I mean, there are any number of uh, formation processes by which we can become witnesses. Uh, the institutional church, remember, is not an end in itself. It's, it's the platform to enable us to be reaching out towards what is not church. <laughs> uh, the church is for the world, not the world for the church. The, uh, it's, it's a hugely important um, uh, understanding of, I, I think, again, Vatican, Vatican II's understanding and Pope Francis' understanding. So yes, the RCIA may be a launch pad. Um, there, there are other launch pads, I hope, for instance, that some of the LGBT groups in which uh, I help to uh, keep going and accompany people as they learn to stand up and be who they are in the midst, sometimes of a frightening world and sometimes of a frightening church, and sometimes a mixture of the two. I hope that those are launch pads for people who will find themselves bearing witness over time in strange ways, because Christianity without witness is, a, is, is, is not a thing. <laughs> the, the witness is a sign that there is an other other yeah. that god is an other other not simply the same old human political religious uh, other that just drives all of us into the ground the sign that there is another other is produced by witnesses mm -hmm. that seems to me to be a central part of what we're about yeah, and being able to engage in that witness, you know, if if we accept this understanding of learning as relational rather, or kind of prior to rationality, that being able to engage in that witness, we first have to be able to find that expansion of relationships. We have to Indeed. be able to enter into that expansion of relationships. Uh, allow ourselves to be formed, work where work out where the formation is good, where it's less good, mm -hmm. where we're being humanized, where we're being dehumanized. Mm -hmm. um, and being allow ourselves to be prepared for the unexpected moment when we will, might be asked to stand up, <laughs> right. because that's what your vocation, our vocation is. It's in a sense, it's being being found at our post, whatever our post is. <laughs> um, yeah. I do want to just simply uh, offer a, uh, an affirmation that was received along these lines. Um, uh, Sarah says to us, thank you for your presentation, your description of a horizontal form of knowledge, power, etc. gives me hope and inspiration as I learn more about what it means to be a minister in the world today. And I think that's, um, uh, again, just this idea of witness and ministry and the relationship between those, for those who are in formation. Um, right. Yeah. Um, 
so another question that uh, we have is um, a question about uh, reconciling uh, understanding of the historical experiential with Catholic teaching on divine revelation. Um, uh, and, and I think this comes back to this kind of really what you set up in the very beginning of the talk, but uh, maybe just if you want to speak a little bit more about this, um, uh, a question of God's revelation not being historical or a experiential. Um, uh, this questioner asks, uh, are, says that the Catholic Church understands divine revelation as privileged, completed, authoritatively handed on through scripture and tradition, um, and binding and guiding. Um, and um, I think this kind of comes back to how you how you began uh, the, the discussion. Um, but maybe if you could just expand a little bit about your understanding of how Vatican II may have. Uh, yes, yes. Uh the interesting thing is uh, that, of course, uh, the fullness of revelation uh, had happened by the time of and is contained in the apostolic witness, uh, mm -hmm. understood traditionally to end with the uh, apocalypse of John. Um, and that this is uh, uh, given to us with the Hebrew scriptures. And and this is this was an, a very important change of words which happened at Vatican II. Um, and which people tend not to um, uh, tend not to remember, which is that the original version talked about uh, in words and deeds, and this was changed to in deeds and words, <laughs> gestis et verbis. Mm -hmm. It's the deeds which come before the words. This is not primarily a verbal, in our sense of literal communication. Mm -hmm. It's God's deeds. It's the happening which leads to the talking. The happening, which was a series of happenings from the choice of uh, Israel, uh, from the inspiring of the prophets, from the covenant at Sinai, to the ultimate happening, which was Jesus coming amongst us <laughs> and uh, teaching us and going to his death and rising again and giving us the Holy Spirit or allowing the Father to give us the Holy Spirit, which he had made available, depending on uh, which side of the Orthodox Catholic <laughs> divide you want, to, um, uh, you want to be. All of that is completely definitive. Now, the question is how that is communicated and, and uh, passed on amongst us. And of course, that is not in the first instance a question as to the truth of the divine message. It is an anthropological truth about how we learn. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that that people need to rethink. I'm not suggesting anything untraditional in terms of the content of the uh, of divine revelation. On the contrary, I think I'm a very I, I'm a very conservative Catholic theologian. Um, but uh, <laughs> I am suggesting that the anthropology of learning has changed enormously, mm -hmm. and that the anthropology of learning, which is of course not part of uh, of divine revelation per se is something which we're constantly on catch up with so as to try to be able to understand divine revelation better. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, that seems to me to be the important uh, uh, point there. So yes, which is why I, I mentioned the notion that in this uh, helicoidal sideways movement, this is not a, a saying, okay, uh, the people are always right, bishops are always wrong. It's a saying, no, the relationship between uh, non-baptized, so sorry, between baptized and ordained is going to shift very uh, very significantly as it is, given that there is a mutual process of learning and sifting through what is true going on, rather than the claim that some people by virtue of ordination know everything, <laughs> which other people don't. And therefore the job of the people is to obey or receive it as though learning Densinger in Latin uh, was the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. It isn't, it's very, very useful, but it's not the answer to everything. <laughs> And, you know, it struck me as I was hearing you describe this shift, um, obviously, how many decades have passed since we we were, you know, offered the opportunity to reconceive and particularly that um, struck by that image of the head and the body and kind of the, you know, the, the in, the, in the Catholic tradition. The, the, um, oh, and, the, Car the Cartesian underpinnings of that right. understanding. Right. And that is, that is nothing sacred. That is a particular philosophical tradition. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and one, one, one which has clearly is now clearly passed its sell-by date. Mm -hmm. And of course, 
and the notion the notion that the church can hold on to a 16th to 19th or 20th century philosophical understanding while its own lay people are advanced into a quite other form of anthropological understanding is a completely self-destructive uh, uh, exercise. Uh, yeah, and this brings me to a, another question that's actually specific to what we're discussing now. Um, 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 Matthew asks, um, why is Descartes singled out as the origins of the a priori approach to Catholic um, theology, um, suggesting that uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch identifies bishops with Christ and requires harmony with them? St. Thomas Aquinas follows Aristotle in saying theology is deduction from um, uh, a priori givens. Um, so is, is it... Um, is it entirely accurate to identify, I guess, this specifically with oh, Descartes? Not at all. No, 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 not at all. The the a prioristic way, or way, a way of thinking is particularly associated with uh, with Aristotle. Um, mm -hmm. So, no. the The interesting thing about Descartes uh, and why why I brought in Descartes was not because he invented the a prioristic. He didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. On the contrary, uh, mm -hmm. but because the relationship between the spirit and the fear of the body was what uh, was so strong uh, with Descartes, which is why uh, he was able to fit in, or a, a bowderized form of him was able to fit in so nicely to a, a particular particular hierarchical understanding of the head, which has the clear and distinct ideas and the failing body. Now, that wasn't the understanding at the time uh, of Aquinas, where, where the, the medieval world, curiously, was much more horizontal than, uh, uh, than, than, uh, uh, than that. Um, the as it were, the, the rise in um, a top-down uh, anthropology is a much more early modern affair than it is mm -hmm. uh, uh, an, ancient, uh, uh, an, an ancient affair. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I would agree entirely with that, that question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, I'm not saying that a priori in principle is impossible. The question with a priori is always when you have to realize that it's run out of usefulness mm -hmm. rather than insisting on trying to apply it where it, you know it can no longer be applied. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, um, Aristotle made the fantastic observation uh, from frogs that their, the gender of their offspring depend on the wind and uh, the, the temperature and the degree of humidity. Uh, the, the direction of the wind and the temperature, the humidity. This is a, was an extraordinary observation, um, mm -hmm. uh, and it's true. I mean, you have to be a pretty classy marine biologist to have worked that out, let alone mm -hmm. in. From, it is a mistake if you apply the same principle to human reproduction, mm -hmm. which he did. Mm -hmm. So the, assum the assumption for much of the Middle Ages, following Aristotle's a priori, was that the gender of the human would be male if the right weather conditions uh, prevailed or would be the imperfect female if the wrong weather conditions. Mm -hmm. This is a good example of uh, something which in its field is an appropriate <laughs> deduction, right. but actually uh, doesn't apply to mammals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful example, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, Aristotle, and, Aristotle was a very, the very rigor very, very, with which the initial, um, you know, or, or the basis on which the initial claim is made, you know, affirming the kind of rigor of that um, uh, claim, uh, and also acknowledging that it, it the limits of it. Animals, right. With the, right. That's why I tried to talk about it with, with the relation to children. Um, with a small, a small baby, you don't know what kind of music they're going to like, um, what colours are going to be their favourite colours, which animals they long to imitate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You will learn that over time. And your gift-giving to them will become more and more specific <laughs> Yes, as you discover who they are. Yes. Um, uh, and I think that's a really, um, such an accessible... That is, that is tremendously such important. Such an accessible analogy <laughs> for so many of us. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that one. Um, uh, one of our guests, uh, Janet, asks, if you have any resources to share about the topic of shame, uh, Jesus is occupying the place of shame and our shame. Mm. So. Not as many as I would like. Uh, there was actually a very, very good book on shame written by somebody called Schneider quite a long time ago, um, which I have used. Um, I myself wrote a paper attempting to look at it, actually, um, 
a couple of years back, which I can make available to 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 you when you're welcome to share with. I can make it available to you after the after the session, and you're welcome to share with it. Um, but but I'm very grateful for that question because I think that it is absolutely central to uh, overcoming culture wars <laughs> in uh, our societies at the moment is learning to cope with shame and realizing how Christianity at its very best is precisely not producing more shame, <laughs> which unfortunately many, many variants of it are inclined to do, but on the contrary, enabling people to sit tenderly with shame and it to become the space of grace, which of course is, <laughs> is what is the, cent the center of our faith. <laughs> how a space of shame became the center of grace. Um, uh, we understand that curiously much better if we see Jesus's death as affecting the whole of our humanity rather than and, and being something because Jesus actually likes us as we are, rather than paying the price for sin. And they're saying, well, you're all awful, but I'm covering the sin stuff over. Now behave. Mm -hmm. Because actually, for most of us, sin is often enough merely the, the flecks of foam on the on the turf surface of the sea at the bottom of which there is huge shame that we don't really it runs us beyond control mm -hmm. uh this is the coping with the shame that undoes the sin rather than the other way around <laughs> right well we would be very grateful if you would share with us that resource and we'd be happy to share it with our with our community i would love to read your the beginnings of your work <laughs> yeah, i'm sorry it's, it's it's not sufficient but it's a beginning yeah well, that's what we're, we're all on that journey. <laughs> um, I uh, several people have asked um, whether or not they this talk might be available for them to um, to review and to hear again. And the answer is yes, uh, we do make it available. Um, it, is, it has been such a rich conversation. Um, and um, uh, James, you've offered us uh, so many um, uh, places to begin to enter into reconceiving in the and I think in this time of um, exploring synodality, um, just really beautiful um, opportunities for us. So I um, want you all to know that um, this will be posted and um, Alice will be able to share with us um, details about that. Um, you know, I'd just like to end by asking, um, you know, one of the, I, I um, appreciate the, the, um, the way in which you oriented us at the beginning of this, of this talk. Um, the kind of that you were going to engage in some unashamed blue sky thinking. Um, and, you know, I, I wonder if as we end the talk, if you might be able just to offer us um, your um, your thoughts, your musings, your, uh, 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 are, is this a hopeful moment uh, for us as we, as we attempt to move forward? And if so, what is the source of the, you know, um, of the hope in the blue sky? Well, it is. Um though never hopeful enough. You know, I've participated in the synodal process to the best of my abilities, but here in Spain, for instance, uh, I helped with the, create a network of all the Spanish, the different LGBT believers groups, ecumenical in different cities uh, to make our response. And we discovered that of all the dioceses of Spain, one diocese had spoken to the local group, two more, and two more attempts had been made to talk to people from the diocese with zero response and the rest of the diocese, which is over 20 something, no conversation at all. So despite both the Pope and the Synodal team having made it quite clear that they really wanted this issue to be discussed, in many cases, the hierarchy is incredibly frightened and scared, uh, uh, frightened and scared is the same thing, uh, frightened and ashamed of this reality, because of course it's their reality, in the case of most of the bishops, most of the priests, we know that a vast disproportion of gay people. And so their inability to talk about this, let alone to be you to you, mm -hmm. is a constant source of difficulty mm -hmm. for taking this forward. So yes, there is hopefulness in the sense that uh, we are in a very hopeful stage in Rome, long may it last. Uh, but nevertheless, the dead weight of many bishops' conferences, and, and yours in the United States is a particularly dead weight, dare I say it, by comparison with um, mm -hmm. um, 
with many other countries, and certainly with most South American countries, South Americans have got far ahead on relation with relation to these things. Yeah. Um, but it's, it can often be very, um, can often be really quite quite depressing. Um, so yes, the the divine gift of hope doesn't mean not being depressed. It means uh, sticking in there despite being often depressed, uh, and right. allowing uh, allowing God to produce God's hope and God's joy uh, in the midst of this at, at the right time. Uh, sorry, sorry, not to be more uh, glitzy than that, but I think it would be unfair to people. Indeed, indeed. And um, I, I, again, just this calling of us to uh, grow more expansive in our relationships, that that kind of, um, that expansiveness uh, will allow for new forms of learning and the op openness to, to truth um, is a, something that I will certainly carry with me um, as, as, and I, I also think that in community, we, we have the opportunity to um, move through our sorrow and our depression uh, together in ways that yeah. can, um, can be really, um, we can see the fruits of the spirit in that work. So, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to um, just, uh, again, offer our gratitude to you for, for being with us and for offering us um, um, such an important um, source of, of, of refiguring uh, our thinking around and our our act, actions, more importantly. Um, and I uh, want to pass now back to Alice, um, who will um, give us a, a little bit of closing remarks. Thank you, Marie. Um, I have added a brief survey in the chat, and we would appreciate it if you would take a moment and to quickly fill it out for us. We want to ensure that we continue offering quality lecture events that meet the questions and needs of our community, just as James' lecture has done today. We are so glad that you joined us for this What's Next series lecture event, and we hope to see you at our future events. This is a special year for the Aquinas Center as we celebrate our 35th anniversary. We have so many exciting things planned for this year ahead. On October 4th, we will gather both virtually and in person for our Catholic Orthodox lecture, which will be co-sponsored with Black Church Studies here at Candler School of Theology. Michelle Watkins will be discussing women and theosis. And then on October 19th, we will also gather both virtually and in person for our annual major Catholic speaker lecture, co-sponsored by Candler School of Theology and Commonweal Magazine. For this event, Cecilia Gonzalez Andrew will offer a journey into the mysterious unity of things, which will be a discussion of the art of John August Swanson. If you are able to join us in person, there will be opportunities to gather for dessert and fellowship after the lecture, and even get a sneak peek at some of Swanson's extraordinary art and archives here at Candler. A heartfelt thank you to you, James Allison, Marie Marquardt, Common Meal Magazine, and to all who have joined us today. We appreciate your engaging questions and the comments that you have offered, and we hope to see you at a future events. Thank you.